Good morning, I'm Carlos Fernandez, po policy analyst at the Vegas Chamber. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to our call with State Labor Commissioner Shannon Chambers with the Vegas Chamber Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Tom Burns. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to explain some features of this call. In order to preserve high sound quality, we'll be muting everyone in the call besides our presenters to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you'd like to ask a question, there are a few ways you could do so. If you join this call on the web or through the mobile app, you can ask a question by using the chat feature on the interface. We'll ask a question on your behalf. You can also ask a question by clicking the hand raise button on the interface. We'll call your name and unmute your line so you can ask your question. Once you have asked your question, we'll read me your line so everyone in the call can hear the answer. In order to preserve time, we ask that you please keep questions brief and we'll be taking all questions in the call. Now, please welcome the Vegas Chamber Chairman and the Board of Trustees, Tom Burns. Carlos, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. This is Tom Burns. I'm the Chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Vegas Chamber. Thank you for joining us today as we partner with the State Labor Commissioner, Shannon Chambers, to bring you information that, about the important federal and state guidelines that employers need to follow during the COVID-19 crisis. During this webinar, Labor, Labor Commissioner Chambers will give, give employers information about reopening guidelines and how businesses can access federal and state resources. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to let you know a couple of things going on with the Vegas Chamber. Applications for the Vegas Chamber's Leadership Las Vegas program are now open. The 10-month program gives you a deeper understanding of Southern Nevada so that you can become more insightful and a better community leader. Applications are due by June 11th. Go to leadership.vegas to apply. Additionally, Enrollment is open for our leadership skills training class called Leadership Advance. It's for, for professionals at all levels who want to become more effective leaders and managers in their organization. The class will begin in August. You may apply, you may apply and enroll on Vegas. Or, I'm sorry, leadership.vegas. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today's discussion, Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. I'll let you take it away with some opening remarks. Good morning and thank you, um, Las Vegas Metro Chamber. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to your members again and thank you for setting all this up. And I went back and looked at my calendar and I conducted one of these on April 2nd with your organization. And I can't believe we are now in June and it feels like an eternity. And um, that's just in my opinion, but I can't believe that that was almost 60 days ago that we kind of went through some of the initial issues that started to pop up involving employers and employees in the state of Nevada related to uh, the COVID-19 public health emergency. So I'm gonna kind of go over some of those topics again and also go over some of the new issues that we are seeing as people start to return to work or choose not to return to work and that's becoming a big issue, but I will go ahead and go through kind of the slides and the presentation and you know, offer some comments along the way. And then at the end, obviously, I'm happy to answer questions. And to the extent there's more questions, um, Tom and Paul know and Mary Beth know that you can always reach out to me and contact me and um, we can work through whatever issues are coming up. And, you know, I just want to say that for all of us, you know, like, like I said, going back 60 days ago, this was uncharted territory. So I think Nevada employers have done an amazing job and Nevada employees have done an amazing job getting through this and trying to get the state back back in the right you know, frame of mind and in motion again. So with that, I will go ahead and kind of start. And like I said, you know, Paul and Tom, feel free to jump in anytime, but I'll kind of move through the slides fairly quickly just so I can leave time for questions. So Carlos, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the first issues that came up and this was an issue based on Senate Bill 312 that was passed last legislative session. Senate Bill 312 required paid leave to be provided in the state of Nevada to employees who worked for an employer that had 50 or more employees. That law took effect January 1st, 2020. So there were some exemptions to that requirement. So if you were an employer, and I'll just kind of round the numbers here, but if you were an employer that basically offered 40 hours of paid leave based on a typical 52-week work schedule for a full-time employee, and you were doing that prior to January 1st, 2020, you were exempt from the requirements of Senate Bill 312. That also applied to employers that had collective bargaining agreements that offered that type of similar amount of leave. If you were not one of those employers that had paid leave prior to January 1st, 2020, you were required to start implementing that as of that date. 
you had a choice to either allow an employee to earn that hourly and accrue it that way, or you could have done what's called front loading. So you could have loaded 40 hours on the books as of January 1st, 2020, and then let that employee utilize it over the course of what they call the benefit year. The bill also applied to part-time employees. They did carve out another exemption for employers for the first two years of business. Now that has to be a new business. Um, it's not a business that has been around for 20 years and then decides to change its name. This is a truly a new business. That was the intent of the law. So what started to happen when the COVID-19 situation started to hit in early March, and again, there was a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty. So the terms like quarantine, the terms government quarantine, the terms federal, state, local quarantine started to be thrown around. So the labor commissioner decided at that point in consultation with obviously the administration and with the public health officials that should a, an event come, come to pass in Nevada where there was actually an official government quarantine that if employees were prevented from coming to work that they should not use that paid leave that they were provided based on Senate Bill 312 unless they chose to do so because a government quarantine is not necessarily an employee's fault. It was the position of the labor commissioner that that time off in the event that there was going to be a government quarantine should not be taken away from the employee. Again, as I stated in this guidance, if an employee wanted to use paid leave for that particular type of a situation, they would certainly be entitled to do that. One of the wrinkles though, unfortunately again, that nobody could foresee was that the new requirements of Senate Bill 312 became effective on January 1st, 2020. However, employees were not, not entitled to utilize that leave for 90 days. So if you go from January 1st, 2020 to the end of March, that's around 90 days. However, many of the shutdowns and many of the closings and many of the directives that started to happen not only at the federal level but at the state level started to happen in early to mid-march so there were employees that were laid off or were furloughed or were let go um, in early to mid-march and even later who never ever had the right to utilize that leave that they had been earning or accruing so it is the recommendation of the labor commissioner and i will say that most employers have been very very good on this as you're bringing employees back and senate bill 312 speaks to this if you are bringing employees back now you need to reinstate that leave and you need to start allowing them to use that because it's a situation where they never received the real benefit of the law and they never really received um, what they had accrued and were allowed to take it. So that is the recommendation of the labor commissioner. The other thing I will mention about paid leave and it's in the context of furloughs and we're still getting these questions. And 60 days ago when, you know, or 59, however, when I did the initial presentation, I kind of recommended to employers and, you know, every employer is different. There's large and small and in between, but employers really needed to make the decision of, are you going to furlough employees or are you going to lay them off? Um, try not to keep them in an in-between world where, you know, you're, you're fearful of laying them off because you don't want the impacts of unemployment. Um, you know, I think a lot of those issues in terms of how that's going to look on the employer rating and different things like that, there's gonna be legislation and already has been that's going to address that. But what we saw employers doing back in April and what we see them doing now is they don't wanna lay off employees. And I understand, you know, if you have good employees, the last thing you wanna do is lay them off and potentially lose them. But what employers are trying to do now and have been over the past couple months is if there is paid leave available is requiring or quote unquote forcing the employees to utilize that paid leave to make up for the hours that they have been furloughed. I don't recommend that. Again, that's a decision that an employer is going to have to make. And depending upon the agreement you have with your employees, they may choose to utilize that paid leave to make up those hours, but again, it should be a choice. And I say that because the intent of Senate Bill 312 was to really let the employee have the choice on how and when they were gonna use that leave. 
Now, nobody ever envisioned COVID-19. So again, certainly understand from an employer perspective that you know if there's employees that have, and there's some, there's some organizations, um, even though they qualified for the exemption where they have employees that have eight to 10 weeks of paid leave available to them and are asking, well, why can't I force them to use it? And you know, you certainly can go down that road. Again, I'm trying to make it a much more collaborative situation. And if the employee wants to utilize that leave, have them sign for it, have them document it, that you know they are agreeing to utilize that leave. But again, I don't like the idea of forcing somebody to do something. And um, I just say that as the commissioner because that can produce some some bad results down the line. So again, if you are going to furlough people and you're trying to make them make up those hours from paid leave, again, present that to the employee. Um, if that's something they wanna do, then certainly um, have them sign and document that and um, you can go forward with that. But this issue is still popping up and the issue of you know, whether I'm furloughing or not furloughing um, it is still going on and it is still going on in the context of paid leave. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So the non-essential business closure announcement, that was again, towards the end of March, there was a first announcement and then this was the second official announcement. And the only reason I'm gonna mention this slide is there is still the issue of what is essential and what is not essential. And now that we're in phase two of the opening, um, that issue has died down a little bit, but the governor in this directive and through the emergency regulation package designated what was an essential business and what was a non-essential business. So our office is still getting the calls of, and I'll just use this as an example of, we know an employer that is a shipping company and all they're doing is shipping perfume. How is that essential? Well, because the governor said that shipping and logistics are essential. So we're kind of over um, that, <laughs> that discussion. And again, not trying to be harsh about that, but if your business was deemed essential, and even now some of the non-essential businesses, now that we're in the new phase of reopening, the governor has made it official that those businesses are open. And so as an employer, you have a right to open and you have a right to start calling employees back. I would also mention that how this is coming up as well is the quote unquote stay at home order that not only our governor, but a lot of the other governors and the Centers for Disease Control of, we're recommending people stay home. You should stay home. Yes, that is technically guidance, but it is not an official um, directive at this point. So when employees say, well, the governor said we need to stay home, it's guidance. Um, the governor also said that in terms of essential businesses that they were open and those employees that were working for essential businesses had to go and work. And again, that's a choice of the employer in terms of who they wanted to bring back. And from the employee side, that was also a choice of who wanted to continue working. But we're kind of over, um, over those discussions at this point, not to say that they're not still coming up, but we are now in phase two of the opening. And if the governor has dictated that these are the businesses that could stay open and now the businesses that re can reopen, that means that the employer has a right to bring those employees back. So I'll talk about a little bit later if the employee refuses to come back in the context of unemployment. But at this point, um, if you are a business that's allowed to open in phase one, phase two, or if you've been operating as essential all the way along, you have a right to call your employees back and to have them working. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So general information about Nevada labor laws, and I'll kind of run through these um, fairly quickly, but now that employers are bringing employees back, it's important to still remember what Nevada labor laws are. And Nevada has some unique um, labor laws, and I'll mention the big one. So minimum wage, Nevada has a two-tier minimum wage system. So if you're offered health insurance, the employer can pay a lower rate, which currently is $7.25 if you're offered health benefits. If you are not offered health benefits, it's $8.25 an hour. Now, the interesting part of all the events leading up to June and July is July 1st, 2020. There will be an increase in the minimum wage. 
So Assembly Bill 456 passed during the last session mandates incremental raises in the minimum wage starting July 1st, 2020. The Labor Commissioner has those bulletins published on our website. The other unique thing about Nevada minimum wage is it ties into overtime. So the amounts that you're seeing on this screen right now will go up in terms of the minimum thresholds for overtime. And where those kick in is Nevada, again, being unique, <laughs> has a law that if you work over eight hours in a 24 hour period and you make less than one and a half times the minimum wage, depending upon if you're offered health benefits or not, that you are required to be paid overtime. There are many groups that don't like that eight hour rule. And I've had discussions since I've been the labor commissioner about that. The legislature at this point has not changed that. So it is still the law in Nevada. And then obviously over 40 hours of work in a work week, unless you're a salary employee, overtime kicks in. So we still see employers getting caught in the over eight hour in a 24 hour period. And again, if you have an, a, an organization where you're doing a lot of shift work or different things like that, we're happy to run through you know, the schedules and different things like that so that you don't get caught in that eight hour rule. Um, unfortunately, we've seen some bad situations with that. You can have an agreement for an employee to work four tens. What I always say with that is it needs to be something that is signed for and agreed to by both parties. And it needs to be a schedule that is consistent. So it shouldn't be, well, I'm gonna do a 410 this week and then I'll do one three weeks. It needs to be consistent. So again, if you're gonna do that, um, have, have the employees sign for that and have an agreement on file. But in terms of minimum wage, and I'll give our website information at the end, we have the amount that it's gonna go up to, it's basically $8 and $9. So if you're offered health insurance, not, or if you're not, um, all the bulletins are on our website, but I just wanna make sure that I let everybody on this call know that the labor commissioner is taking the position that the minimum wage is going up July 1st, 2020, according to the law passed during the last legislative session. So another main point in Nevada is, can my employment be terminated? And in light of COVID-19, can it be terminated if I say I don't wanna come in? Yes, Nevada is an at-will employment state. So technically your employment can be terminated at any time without notice or cause. I don't recommend that. Um, there should be some type of documentation of why the employee was let go and what the cause was because that protects you legally from other potential issues including discrimination or different things like that but you as an employer in the state of nevada and i've said that all along if an employee refuses to come into work and again the business is operating and that employer has a right to call that employee back you certainly have the right to terminate employment if they don't so can you decrease the rate of pay you certainly can there's a seven day notice period and just for context, the labor commissioner, since I've been commissioner, has been interpreting these days requirements as business days. And we did pass a regulation package last December that will codify that, that when we're talking about days, we're talking about business days. And one of the reasons I've always taken that position is because if you don't, um, it creates some ridiculous results, especially in light of the fact of if you're going to terminate employee or fire an employee, those wages due to that employee are technically due within three days. So by not interpreting that as business days, we were seeing some absolutely ridiculous cases where the penalties for not paying somebody within three days were more than the actual wages owed. So I always took the position that we were going to apply it as business days. We are seeing issues with the final payment. I will tell you the some employers not being able to make the final payment so we have been contacted and i would encourage you as an employer that the faster you reach out to us to let us know that you're not going to be able to make payroll we can help you with notices and different things like that that you can give to the employees but we are seeing that issue um, and it's an issue that ties into the ppp so the paycheck protection program which our office does not have jurisdiction over i know the chamber has you know, done some presentations on that and there's additional federal guidance on that, but 
you know, it's one of those issues where we don't have money this week, but we might have it next week. So again, we'll work with you. Um, but what we don't like to see is 20 people file a complaint with our office saying that such and such employer didn't make payroll. And in terms of potential investigations, you know, that's where as the commissioner, that's where administrative penalties and different things like that might kick in because as the commissioner, I might say, you know, you knew, you knew this was gonna happen. And instead of trying to do the right thing, you kind of let let <laughs> let the wrong thing happen. So again, it's a balance, but um, please bring those issues to our attention because we'll try and help you with that. So an employee that is quitting, um, it's seven days for the paycheck. So seven days or the next regularly scheduled payday, whichever is earlier. Um, again, try to stick to those guidelines. And if you can't communicate with the employee, that's one of the issues too that we're seeing a lot of is it's not so much that employers are not doing the right thing, it's just they're not communicating um, with the employees like they should be. And that's certainly understandable given everything that everybody's dealing with, but that has the potential to lead to potential wage claims and complaints. So again, um, you know, work those situ situations out. So another minor bill, and I call, call it a minor bill, and it's actually, I joke around, but it was called the NyQuil bill. So in light of everything with COVID-19, there was a bill, Assembly Bill 181, that talked about if an employee called in sick, did they actually have to come to work to prove that they were sick? So how this came about was there was an employee who called in sick, the employer didn't believe them, apparently this employee drank NyQuil and crashed their car. So in light of COVID-19 and Assembly Bill 181, um, never did I think that this bill would actually be relevant, but it kind of sort of is. So if somebody calls in sick, um, you can't make them come in. Now, what I would say to this particular section and bill and what I would say about COVID-19 in light of other illnesses is obviously COVID-19 is a public health emergency and there are certain guidelines, directives and requirements, not only at the federal, but at the state level, but that doesn't prevent you from as an employer from addressing attendance issues with employees that may be abusing leave or sick leave for issues not related to COVID-19. As I like to tell people, COVID-19 and the laws and the regulations and the federal guidance and the state is directed specifically at COVID-19. Now, long-term, how the states and governments, you know, address some of these issues, whether it's paid sick leave or expanded paid leave or expanded medical leave or expanded Family Medical Act leave, um, you know, we'll have those discussions down the road. But these laws that have been passed, they're not a free for all. And I would use that term is there's still the normal labor laws and there's still the employer employment relationship. So if you have somebody that is abusing their leave, you certainly have a right to address that. The one comment I would make on that, and I'll make it as we get into the paid sick leave on the federal side, is that our healthcare providers may not be able to provide doctor's notes and things like that in a you know super timely fashion, and it's not their fault. You know, obviously they're dealing with a public health emergency, so there needs to be some flexibility built into that. That if you're asking an employee for a doctor's note, you may not get that. Um, as soon as you want it, um, you can still ask for it. But again, you just have to be a little bit flexible with that. So the issue now that's also coming up is now that Nevada's moved into phase two and other states are reopening, um, and, and I, I manage 20 employees as well, as people are starting to ask themselves, well, can I go on vacation again? Can I travel again? And what I've told my staff and what I'm telling Nevada employers is, you know, you certainly as an employer have a right to approve or not approve vacations as as directed by your policy or as directed by your business need. What employers and employees still need to know is that there are there are still travel restrictions, not only in Nevada, but in many of the other states. And not only has that guidance been put out by the Centers for Disease Control, but also from the state and public health officials. So, you know, even in Nevada, and, you know, I had to ask somebody like two weeks ago, and I wasn't trying to be ignorant, but I said, is it okay for me to drive to California? And, you know, um, the answer is, is yes, but the direction has been, you know, again, 
employers and employees need to use their discretion. And there might be a situation where somebody travels somewhere or even in state is exposed to somebody that potentially has COVID-19 or COVID-19 symptoms, and they might have to self quarantine. And, you know, that creates the call to me that says, you know, I can't believe that my employee went out of town and I had one two weeks ago. Um, the employee told the employer they were going out of town. <laughs> Turns out they went to New Jersey. So New Jersey at that time was one of the hot spots for COVID-19 activity. And so the employee came back and the employer said, well, you know, how was your trip? And the employee said, well, I was in New Jersey. So out of precaution, the employer said, well, you know, I can't have you on this on this job site in the interest of all the other employees. So they offered the employee, you know, you're going to have to take paid leave or you're going to maybe have to go leave without pay. So again, you know, address those issues on a case by case basis, document, document, document. The other issue that's coming up right now is now that things are opening up and we all saw the news last week of Memorial Day and the Lake of the Ozarks with 300 people in a pool. Many people have social media now. Many people love to post every picture that they've ever taken every minute of the day. So there are employees who are posting pictures of themselves um, at pool parties, at barbecues. Um, I won't get into the other ones that I've seen, but employers seeing those pictures and saying, do I have to you know, let this person back into, <laughs> into the office? Do I have to let them back into the work site? So there is a random section in Nevada Revised Statute Section 613 that talks about social media and it mainly talks about it when employees are originally applying for a job or going through the interview process and how employers can and can't use social media. But again, what I would say to you is, you know, you have to address those situations to the best of your ability. And if you truly think that there is a potential health situation my advice is to err on the side of caution and to have that employee out of the office for however many days it needs to be. If it's a self-quarantine, it's typically 14 days um, that they need to be out of the office. But again, document, document, document. And you know, if the employee can telework, um, that may be an option. Um, but again, err on the side of caution because the last thing you want as an employer is having another employee get other employees sick and and have to deal with that situation so if you do have employees that are still traveling for work and you're requiring them to travel for work you just need to be aware that there might be a situation where based on that travel they may not be able to get back in the office and you just need to be aware of that and to the extent that you know you can limit travel right now um you know that would be the best recommendation but certainly i know and uh, many of us know that there are some essential businesses and just some workers that have to travel right now. But again, as an employer, you just need to know that they may have to be out of the office just based on the public health guidance and based on future health guidance that could come out. Cleaning costs and deducting cleaning costs related to COVID-19 from employees, I'm saying that's an absolute no. Um, you know, I'd have to see the situation where um, that could that could be justified coming out of an employee's paycheck. You know, that's the cost of doing business, unfortunately, and it does fall all on the employers. And I don't know how all of this is going to shake out on the insurance side and whether, you know, some employers have started making those claims to insurance companies because some of the cleaning costs and, you know, depending upon the level of cleaning can be very, very expensive. But the labor commissioner has said, you know, you don't get to pass the cost of hand sanitizer or san, you know, sanitation wipes onto the employee. The other issue in Nevada as far as deductions is an employee has to agree to that and it has to be for a specific amount, pay period and purpose. So, you know, we, we see the deduction issue outside of COVID-19, but it has been my position that that should not be something that is being passed on to the employee, and I totally get it. Um, you know, I totally get the position of an employee or employer that, you know, we had somebody that went off and did something reckless and they came back into the office and they got people sick and now I have to deal with it. And I, believe me, I certainly appreciate that and, and feel um, for your position, but, you know, this is where the laws as, as an employer, unfortunately, a lot of things fall on you as the employer. And again, 
I just do not recommend trying to pass those costs on right now. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So the, I'll go through this very quickly. Just a reminder about Nevada labor laws. They're still in effect. We have all the required bulletins on our website. There was no suspension of Nevada labor laws. Um, some people thought that. Um, I will tell you that we also regulate public works projects and prevailing wage, so road construction, school construction. There has been an impression that because of COVID-19, all those laws are suspended. That is not the case. Nevada labor laws are still 100% in effect. Now, we are willing to grant extensions and to be reasonable, and we certainly have been. So again, if you are subject to anything right now with our office and you need time, additional time to respond, we have been very, very reasonable, and we certainly appreciate and understand the situation. But Nevada labor laws are still in effect. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So federal paid sick leave, and this has caused, again, a great deal of confusion, unfortunately, for employers and employees on how this was rolled out, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault. Again, this was a public health emergency that had to be addressed very, very quickly, and it became very clear to the federal government that if there were employees who potentially have it, had COVID-19 or were demonstrating symptoms of COVID-19, that there needed to be some type of federal paid sick leave to deal with this emergency situation. So they passed what was called the Families First Coronavirus, Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA. So in this particular bill, and it ties into the Family Medical Leave Act paid leave extension as well, they set aside 80 hours of federal paid sick leave that could be used by employees depending upon the potential health situation that they had. They also provided 80 hours of paid sick leave to address the situation of parents having to stay home because the school started to shut down and the daycares, et cetera, et cetera, and distance learning and different things like that. So I still get the question and now we're in June. So the school year is gonna be ending anyway, but I still get the question, well, are the schools really closed because they're doing distance learning? Yes, the schools are closed. Um, distance learning, while it is certainly a continuation of the education, it is not an open school with physical teachers present and kids physically in a, in a school building. So this 80 hours of federal paid sick leave was specifically intended to address COVID-19. Again, this notion that this is 80 hours of paid leave that can be used for anything is false. So I'll run through these pretty quickly. So the first basis to use this leave is back to the state, federal, or local quarantine, um, that there's been an actual official directive issued that you cannot move from a place or you can't go to a different area because the government has said we are imposing an official quarantine. So the employees entitled to use 80 hours of paid sick leave under federal law. Number two, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine because they might have symptoms related to COVID-19. Number three, the employees experience symptoms of COVID-19 and they're gonna go seek a medical diagnosis. Number four, the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an official quarantine order or who has been advised to self-quarantine. And let me make a point about the self-quarantine under this particular law. Under the Fed, federal paid sick leave law, it is advice from a healthcare provider saying you need to self-quarantine. It's not an employee saying I'm going to, you know, I'm deciding on my own that I'm going to self-quarantine. That might come up in the travel situation. But the federal paid sick leave law, it has to be specific that the healthcare provider is saying you need to self quarantine and not come into the office. So I'll skip to number six and then go back to number five. Number six is kind of a catch all. The employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition that's specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Treasury, or the Secretary of Labor. Um, that has not been fleshed out at this point, but that's kind of a catch-all. So if the employee's out for reason number one, two, three, four, or six, they are entitled to $511 per day, up to a maximum of $5,110. That reimbursement can be obtained through tax credits through the Federal Internal Revenue Service, and they have the forms 
and that procedure um, set up now. I don't know how that's working. Um, that's kind of out of my purview, but they did set a maximum on how much could be paid per day. If the employee is out for any of those reasons of one, two, three, four, or six, the intent of the law was that they would use that full 80 hours in one block. So if you think of that in context of the advice of the health professionals that said you need to quarantine or you need to be out for 14 days, that's where the 80 hours comes in. So the intent was not to allow employees to say, well, I'm gonna use 10 hours one day and five hours the next. It was to use a full 80 hours. So reason number five, um, 80 hours is available. This is the situation where the son or daughter is out because the schools are closed. The employee has to stay home to take care of that child. The federal government said, we are certainly gonna provide leave for that, but we are gonna cap the compensation for that at $200 per day and 2000 in the aggregate. So this particular type of leave under number five it could be used in blocks. Um, again, you know, that creates administrative headaches, good or bad, um, but it is available. They did carve out some exemptions. So healthcare providers were exempt from all of these requirements. Small businesses with fewer than 50 employees were carved out of the situation where the school is closed. However, what the federal government said is if you are gonna take that exception, you need to certify that as what they call the certifying officer. So you could say that I'm an employer with five people and you know all five of them have kids that are home you know, because school's closed. If I have all five of them out, it's gonna jeopardize the viability of the business. So you can certainly take that exception. Um, again, try to work with your employers if telework's available, um, you know, try and offer that to them. But you know, that's kind of a little carve out here that the federal government had in terms of these particular requirements, this is temporary. So all of these laws and all of these provisions are going to sunset December 31st, 2020. So this is not intended to continue on. It is intended to address the health situation related to COVID-19. So let's go to the next slide, Carlos. So they also called out, carved out under the FFCRA um, Extended Family Medical Leave Act. So this is specific, again, just to the situation where the child is out of school. So there is up to 12 weeks of job protected emergency paid leave that is available to an employee if the child's school is closed. So when they talk about the first 10 days being unpaid, they are talking about that first 80 hours under the federal paid sick leave. Then at that point, they go on federal uh, Family Medical Leave Act, and there is now this emergency paid leave that is now available. Um, employers, they can pay the employee two thirds of the wage replacement, again, up to $200 per day. Um, some employers choose to pay more than that. Um, again, that's up to the employer and the employee. The other thing I would mention about this is that this is not automatic. Um, it's kind of like Family Medical Leave Act in general. There has to be documentation and certification signed by the employee and approved by the employer. So again, this has to be a collaborative process. I have had many questions from employees saying, well, I'm going to take my 12 weeks of emergency paid leave. Well, no, you're not, um, because you need to <laughs> fill out the proper forms and you need to make sure that your employer knows about this and how you're going to take the leave. Again, they did carve out some exemptions to this. So in this one, it's with employers that have fewer than 25 employees. Um, they also carved out the healthcare providers and then the exemption from the paid sick leave, where if you have less than 50 employees, you can sign that certification that it's going to potentially jeopardize your business. The other thing I would mention about Family Medical Leave Act, and it's kind of goes hand in hand with this, we are seeing situations where employees had been out on Family Medical Leave Act, and obviously what happened is the business started to either shut down or started to furlough people. Um, they decided that they were just going to show up at work one day because they were scared of losing their job. Um, by law, um, you can't really do that. You know, if, if it's a health situation, the doctor has to clear that employee to come back to work. 
So if you have that situation and somebody just shows up to work one day and they were supposed to be out through say the end of June, you need to document that. And if it's a medical situation, you need to ask them to leave and to go and get the clearance that is required from the medical professionals to actually be back at work. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So I'll just mention this, um, the Federal Department of Labor website, this is on our website, all the information about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, and it's all there. Um, it's also on the Federal DOL website, questions and answers, fact sheets, different things like that. They also have the required posting that you have to have on the federal side for the fed family paid sick leave and also the family leave. So this is also available on their website. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So back to my point about doctor's notes, this was issued March 27th, 2020 by the state epidemiologist in the state of Nevada. It provides guidance on doctor's notes and how you know, again, employees may not be able to get them. It also provides some guidance about symptoms and having employees notify their supervisor and staying home. It also has guidance about if somebody has actually had COVID-19 and recovered, how long they need to be out of the office before they can come back. And again, you know, this is, this is guidelines from um, health professionals, but obviously you may have situations where you're gonna have to adapt to an individual situation, you know, where it may take somebody longer than seven days to truly be symptom free. So again, work with the employers, uh, work with the employee, try to find out if they can telework, try to find out if there's paid leave available. Um, but again, engage in that, you know, employer employee relationship and, and document, document, document. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So the Labor Commissioner does not have jurisdiction over unemployment. However, unemployment and people working and not working run together. So our office has been swamped with questions about unemployment that you know we try and refer to the right entity and that is unemployment. The one comment I would make about unemployment is, and I have had discussions again with the unemployment division about this, is again, the notion now of employees simply refusing to return to work and automatically thinking that they are going to be eligible for unemployment. Um, it is my understanding, again, I don't enforce unemployment laws, but it's my understanding that if you have an employee who is refusing to come to work, that that can be considered abandonment of position. And that form can be filed by the employer with unemployment, which could potentially impact the ability to get unemployment benefits. So the CARES Act, and again, this is just a summary from our office, did provide for some temporary expansion of unemployment, but unemployment is a very regulated um, part of the law and it is insurance. People think of it as benefits and that's what they've called it now, but unemployment at its true form is a form of insurance. So it is intended to, again, address emergency situations and provide a temporary um, replacement of income and you know provide temporary benefits, but I caution, you know, employers and employees that, you know, if if you're telling them that they're automatically going to be eligible for unemployment or that they can just quit, I do not believe, in my opinion, that that is the case, and I do not believe that that is what the law uh, under unemployment says. So, to the extent that you have that happening, you need to document. And like I said, it could be considered an abandonment of position, and that at that point it would go through the unemployment and that employee may or may not be eligible um, for unemployment. I'll also mention the CARES Act because it does provide some provisions for what are called you know the gig workers or independent contractors. My understanding is that rollout of those applications has started and again um, not under our jurisdiction but there is potentially some eligibility for unemployment benefits if you are an independent contractor or, as I said, a gig worker. Um, these provisions, again, are temporary. They're not intended to be permanent. And if you watch the news and um, read the paper, you know, there's already discussions about a potential other stimulus bill that might happen. But there, one side is saying we might consider that, but we are going to stop or reduce some of these temporary expansions of unemployment. And again, that's gonna be a political discussion that will go on over the next month. But 
you know, again, the we've been telling employees and we've been trying to get that message out is, you know, you can't just say I'm refusing to come to work. I mean, if you have a valid reason that, you know, you've got symptoms or any of those potential reasons to use that paid sick leave under the new federal law, you know, you can certainly work with your employer to do that. But simply saying I'm not coming in um, is, is not going to potentially be appropriate when it comes to unemployment benefits. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So telework guide, we published this um, about three weeks ago when it kind of became apparent that telework was probably going to be a longer um, type of a situation for many employers and employees than maybe everybody originally thought. So this is just kind of a general guide. Um, again, you know, I saw something in the paper, or maybe I saw it on one of my news feeds or whatever, but there's situations now where um, employees are starting to say to employers, you know, I need money to expand my work set, workstation at home. I need money to buy a new laptop. I need money for printing. So if you are gonna have folks that are teleworking, and again, you know, that's a judgment call and that's a subjective situation too, but, you know, make sure that it's clear on who's providing the equipment, make sure it's clear on what their hours are, make sure it's clear that if they're logging in from, you know, an outside area, whether it's their home or in the park or whatever, that the security things are in place so that you don't have IT issues. I've heard some horrible <laughs> situations and, and I can say that, you know, from the state government perspective, our technology doesn't keep up with the private side of things and that's not a good thing but you know we have issues with so many people teleworking where sometimes the phones don't work or there have been meetings that have been getting hacked security uh, you know issues so again just make those issues clear with your employer employees and document 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 and you know like i said it works, but you just need to make sure that you monitor it. And I would say this as well, if you have somebody that is out teleworking and now um, they can come back into the office and you ask them to come back in the office and they say, no, I wanna continue teleworking, you have a right to take disciplinary action. So unfortunately, and I wish I didn't have to say this as the labor commissioner, but I have seen situations where you know, an employer has asked an employee to come back and um, certain employees, and I'm not saying all have treated this time off as a vacation. Um, that certainly has not been my experience with most employees, but that has happened. And again, as an employer, you need to document and take whatever action that you need to take. So let's go to the next slide, Carlos. So the release of liability, and I just mentioned this issue, so we put out some general guidance about this. So now that people are being asked to return to work, there are some employers that are crafting very creative, what are called release or releases of liability, basically trying to get employees to sign and saying that they're not gonna sue the employee for anything under the sun. So I'll make a very swift point about this. When it comes to workers' compensation, it is against the law. So Nevada Revised Statute Section 616B.609, it is against the law to have an employee waive their rights to workers' compensation benefits. And again, this is on our website and available um, so that you can take a look at it. It kind of provides some general guidance. You know, even before COVID-19, if you were going to ish, go and, you know, enter into special agreements or severance agreements or different things like that, it's always my recommendation to take advantage of an organization like the Chamber or to talk to an attorney or a human resource professional. But, you know, we're seeing a lot of creative, <laughs> creative things right now. And, you know, we're just trying to put out some general guidance on this. One of the other issues that comes into play is, and it's a legal standard and an issue, but you know, you have people who want their jobs back and you know, they're having economic issues. So by forcing them to sign something, um, are you making them do it under duress or in bad faith? So again, these are potential legal issues that could come out of this. I do know the state and federal governments are talking about potential changes to you know, laws involving liability related to COVID-19. I don't know where that is going to go. Um, that seems to have had more activity at this point on the federal level in terms of discussion, but nothing has been finalized. 
Um, the other thing I would talk about release of liabilities and it kind of ties into having employees apply for their jobs again. So we're seeing this where employers are having certain employees apply for their job again and not having other employees apply for their job again. So the labor commissioner does not enforce discrimination issues. However, when we see them, we refer them on to the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. So as an employer, if you're gonna have employees reapply for their jobs, be consistent. Don't just have one group, whether it's you know um, based on you know age, sex, ethnicity, be consistent. Um, you know, again, it's an at-will employment state. So, you know, if you bring somebody back and they don't work out, you certainly have the right to let them go. But if you're going to ask them to you know, reapply for their jobs, be consistent about that. The other thing I would say too with the furloughs is if you're furloughing all your employees or some of your employees, make sure they know when they could be brought back, make sure how they're being brought back. We're seeing issues where, particularly in the case of restaurants, where a certain group of servers are being brought back, another group's not being brought back. And so we get the call saying, you know, why haven't I been brought back? Every other person's been brought back. Again, back to the communication piece of this. And I certainly feel for, you know, all the employers on this call and all the employers in this state, but the better you communicate with individuals, um, the better off it is and the less claims that it potentially you know, come to our office. So let's go to the next slide, Carlos. So I'm not going to go through this um, so I can have some time for questions. We have posted on our website the roadmap to recovery for Nevada. We have phase one, phase two, and the links to Nevada Health Response. There's also two letters from me to Nevada employers and to the private employment agencies in Nevada that if you want help, we are more than willing to help. My investigators are still going out in the field, obviously using the safety protocols and social distancing, but we are more than willing to help and we are more than happy to take a look at your records and to you know, recommend certain things. And for those of you that have worked with me through the years, we are not a gotcha organization. That doesn't mean that we don't take enforcement action when necessary, but we're here to help. And we would much rather you know, help employers now as they start to get back going and fix things now rather than fix them six months from now. And, you know, I know it's a horrible term, but even if we ask you to do like a self audit and to fix things, we would much rather do that <laughs> than, than take enforcement action. So as the labor commissioner, I have nine investigators for the entire state of Nevada. So back to the point about gotcha, even if I wanted to do gotcha, I just don't have the staff to do it. So we're here to help and we know there's going to be issues as people get back to work and businesses get back up and running, but we are here to help and please reach out to us. And like I said, we, we've been very successful doing that, um, having employers do self audits and fixing things. And again, that helps all of us and it helps eliminate claims and other issues for employers down the road. So I'm going to go ahead and stop and I'm happy to take questions. Great, Commissioner. I appreciate you covered a lot of ground there. We have time for just a couple of questions. We've got some in from uh, some folks on the line. Um, one of the ones is, can employers implement policies that restrict an employee's ability to travel personally outside the state during the pandemic? So I would not recommend that. Okay. Um, I think what you can do, and, and, I've, and I've given the go-ahead, what I'm seeing now is a lot of employers having staff not leave like the the premises for lunch or for breaks i think that is perfectly acceptable that you know as a condition of employment that you know you're not allowed to leave the premises for breaks or lunch i think travel i think that's pushing it <laughs> um you know that that gets into issues that and, I, and i'm just gonna say it but you know we've seen the protests we've seen different things i think that gets into you know, some potential constitutional issues. Now, what I would say is if an employer wants to put an agreement together and an employee signs it and says they're, they're agreeing to it, that's fine. It just may not be enforceable down the road. Sure, sure. Um, what can employees do or employers do if employees refuse to come back to work because they're making more in unemployment and who do we report that to? 
So that would be an employment division issue. And I have a weekly call with them and I can find out specifically where that can be reported to. And I will absolutely follow back up with your organization to tell you exactly where to report that to. But it is an issue right now. Um, you know, my cousin is a hairdresser and she was out. She was out. I mean, I'm not working for eight weeks and she knew people that were making more money on unemployment and that's that's sticking in a lot of people's craw right now and i'll just use that term so um i'll find out specifically for you and where you can report that that great if you can get back to our office we'll, we'll get it out to the people that are on this call um does your office review or offer guidance on employee handbooks we absolutely do so you are more than welcome to send something to us and have exactly what you want us to look at um you know i will say this that there are times where you know we're not going to write it for the employer but we will certainly give them guidance and we do that all the time and like i said just tell us specifically what you want us to look at and we'll look at it and and help with that and um, before we hang up i'll give you exactly where they can send that or they can certainly reach out to me and um you know i'm happy to happy to take a look at it yeah great thank you uh we have probably time for one more question um you mentioned the child care position provisions under the CARES Act. How, how does this work over the summer? Since schools typically closed over the summer? So it has been my position that school is closed over the summer, but not in the sense of COVID-19 closure. It is a normal school schedule closure. So those benefits under the federal paid sick leave and the federal paid leave do not kick in and do not apply because we're not talking about a normal school schedule. Now, the only exception I would say to that is potentially if there is a possibility, and it could happen maybe in some of the rural areas, I don't know, that kids are brought back for summer school physically in a classroom. I'm not sure that's gonna happen, but that would be the only exception to that. And I've had conversations with the Federal Department of Labor, and we talk every two weeks, and that has been their position as well. So again, I feel for these parents, you know, um, not only are the schools closed, but now a lot of the summer camps and, you know, where kids used to be able to go for summer are now closed, but those expanded benefits of federal paid sick leave or paid leave do not apply when it's just a normal school closure for summer. Sure. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned you'd want to reach out. We're going to wrap up. Uh, you, you had uh, mentioned that you had a website or a, a contact information you'd like to share with, with the audience. Could you go ahead and do that? So our website is www.labor.nv.gov. And our contact email, it's mail1, so M-A-I-L, the number one, at labor.nv.gov. And just so everybody knows as well and um we have i personally have been monitoring that mailbox since all of this started in march so when i get the nasty emails and i rarely get them from your group <laughs> but you know i want to talk to the labor commissioner and so you are talking to me um so just know that and we're turning those responses around and through my own sanity uh, we're turning those around typically in 24 to 48 hours but I knew right away that we had to control the message and and get good information out there and it also gives me a good gauge on the issues and the questions so just know that when you're sending that in you are sending it to me now i might refer it on to my staff which is very very good but um i want to give you that confidence that it's not going to go into a mailbox that'll never be answered great Hey, Commissioner, we, do you have time for one more question we just got in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. An uh, employee wants to be paid in cash. What do I do? Is it, isn't that legal if they are collecting? Isn't that illegal if they're collecting unemployment? So I would say yes, as a first guess. <laughs> um, I mean, if they are on unemployment now and, and, you're, and they're still quote unquote an employee, I don't even know how that would work. Um, the only thing I would say to that is just as a general comment, putting the unemployment issue aside, you can pay employees in cash. You just have to document that. And we never recommend that because there's too many ways that that could go wrong. But if I was an employer and I had an employee coming to me and saying, you know, I want to be cash paid off the table because it affects my unemployment, 
I would pick up the phone and call unemployment right away and I would not do that. So again, I will definitely get you the information that your organization needs to give to your members to report issues like that because I have a feeling this is now going to be one of the new issues that is going to come up over and over. So to be clear, that would get reported to uh, probably to Dieter then versus to your department. Yeah, it would be reported to Dieter. I mean, where we would see visibility of it is, again, you know, we would tell the employer, you can pay in cash, you just need to document it. But if it's sure. potential unemployment fraud, that needs to go to, you know, Dieter and to the unemployment division. Now, we could have a situation where the employee could come to our office and say, you know, I worked these hours and I wasn't paid and we would do an investigation and probably come to the same realization that, well, you know, <laughs> you're working fraudulently or you're applying for unemployment fraudulently, but in terms of paying employees in cash in general, I don't recommend it. Sure. Commissioner, you've been very generous with your time and your knowledge. This has been a great hour and I re we really appreciate uh, the time that you spent with us. For those on the line, please know that your chamber is working really hard at all levels of government during this pandemic to, to look after you and your needs. Finally, if you're sick, please stay at home. If you have a loved one that's sick and needs your care, please stay at home and take care of them. If you're healthy and you have the means to do so, please go buy a sandwich at a local business. All right? That's, the, that's all we have for today. Take care of yourself and be safe. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.